you. I've got a lot of doctoral degrees while being introduced, which I never studied for, but I have been given six more years tonight than I've ever had since my birth. So thank you very much, Chris. At this stage, every year counts. So we'll hang on to what we have. Uh, got a lot of help up front there when you've got all the nice luminaries like Sinclair and Cal and all sitting around you. Uh, when the announcement was made that the car lights were on, somebody from the behind leaned over and said to me, this is your moment to get out if you wanted to. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know what, the, what that suggestion was made for, but I almost took him up on it. And then Cal leaned over and said, I thought they didn't make cars like that anymore, that they automatically went out. So my response to him is, obviously, there's one person in the audience who doesn't go to a prosperity church. And, uh, and, and we're very proud of you. Uh, it is possible, of course, you are sitting in a state-of-the-art car and just you're sound asleep in the front there with the lights still on. But hopefully, whoever had it has got it all corrected. It's a real honor to be here, uh, a privilege to be whenever RC invites me to come. It's not always easy to accept. The reason is my calling is to hostile audiences. That's where I go. My primary calling is to go to places where people disagree with me and want to attack the faith. And so we are really evangelist apologists uh, in all kinds of venues. In fact, just the day before yesterday, I was speaking at West Point. I did one, uh, two, now one night, one morning at West Point, one first night to the cadets, next morning to uh, the prayer breakfast of the, that area. And uh, just shortly before that, we were at UCLA on a Wednesday night where nearly 3,000 came for an open forum on the subject, has tolerance become intolerant? So as much as it's wonderful to be here, I wish I could be in places like this more often because you all minister to me. Uh, one man shook my hand and said, you know, I know all of your jokes. And I've, uh, and I've even translated them into Spanish, he said. So, so I shall not be returning in the future. He will be coming with all of the humor for you. So starting off with jokes, uh, I'm to speak tonight on the theme of the resurrection. But I'm going to really call it the link of the resurrection in a life-changing story. Because it doesn't hang on its own. It comes in sequence on some very critical forerunners, both in personages and in the storyline. And I think it was important because every time this question came up with even Jesus on the Emmaus Road, rather than just going to it, and showing them that he was indeed the resurrected Christ, he goes back across history, putting one link into another. They were so overwhelmed with what he had just finished telling them that they invited him for dinner. He feigned as, he was, as if he was leaving, and they said, why don't you stay and have dinner? And when he broke that bread, their eyes were suddenly open, and they said, did not our hearts burn within, within us? When Stephen is about to be martyred, he goes through the whole historic process of one link into another. When Nehemiah and Ezra return in the Old Testament days after the exile, they too retrace this whole thing historically. So the gospel narrative is a story, and this was that the final link after the incarnation, and of course, we all look forward to that ultimate day of consummation when we are in his eternal presence. Before I read the scriptures for you, I want to tell you a little uh, funny anecdote here. Again, if the gentleman is here, you can translate it into Spanish. You probably already have. Um, you know the story of Sherlock Holmes and Watson on a camping trip? I'm sure you've heard it. So these boys are on a camping trip and had plenty of liquid refreshment and went soundly asleep on this bright, starry night. In the middle of the night, Holmes awakened and looked up into the night sky, and he dug his elbow into Watson's ribs, and he said, Watson, Watson, wake up. What do you see? He looked up and he said, stars and stars and more stars. He said, what does that tell you, Watson? 
He said, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Orologically, it tells me that it's about quarter to three in the morning. Meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow will probably be a beautiful day. Theologically, it tells me we're just a tiny part of the great whole. Why, Holmes, what does it tell you? He says, Watson, you idiot, somebody has stolen our tent. <laughs> Have you ever heard all these big sounding words? These extraordinary words that people with no hope, no meaning, no foundation for life actually used to try to soothe our consciences. Maybe that's why they even sometimes lapse into verbiage that they really ought to be careful about. Richard Dawkins was not too long ago with the former dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, who himself, by the way, happened to be a liberal man, but they were debating this issue. And as they were in the middle, in the middle of the debate, uh, Dawkins was making fun of Christians. He said, most of them probably couldn't name the Gospels for you. So the former dean looked at him and said, Richard, your favorite book is Darwin's Origin of Species, isn't it? He said, yes. He said, could you name the full title for me? Dawkins says, yeah, I, I know. It's so long a title. The dean said, go ahead, go ahead. Name it for me. And Dawkins pauses and says, uh, the origin of species, um, um, oh my God, says he. <laughs> I hated to even repeat it, but this was live on the BBC. <laughs> Couldn't think of it, and so the ultimate evidence of the sovereignty of God is that even when somebody who doesn't believe in him calls upon him to remind him of the book in which he started to believe that he didn't exist. <laughs> quite amazing, quite amazing how these things happen. But here it is when we deal with the, with the notion and the reality of the resurrection and the whole gospel story, I'm going to present to you three links the first two are so important, and then they link into the third on the resurrection. But for the atheist, he will deny, or he or she will deny all three. Why? Because they are against the miraculous. Naturalism has to explain everything. For the religionist of various spiritual worldviews, they will definitely deny at least one, if not two of them. The Christian affirms all of these, all three of them, and they are vitally important links in the storyline of the gospel. I've been in the ministry now exactly as long as R.C. has been, 40 years. And I can honestly tell you, the longer I am in this, and the more I'm privileged to defend it, even in front of some of the most hostile audience of the world, I'm more convinced than ever that we have the most beautiful story to tell, and a story that is rooted in truth and relevance, the twin feet on which we must always carry the wings of the gospel here. Beautifully reminding people of how we can soar with it, but when we land, we touch the feet with both ground, truth and relevance. Here's Paul in Acts 17. I've got three passages, I will read two of them. Acts 17, Luke 24, and 1 Corinthians 15. Luke 17, verse 24. The God, I'm sorry, Acts 17 and verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gave all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by God's design and skill. 
In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Between the bookends of creation and the resurrection, he tells the story how God ordained all of this. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, in that beautiful passage, which he received a creed that was already in existence. And even profound critical scholars like Pannenberg or Fuller will say to you that no more than three to eight years had passed when Paul received this creed. It had been in existence even before him. So this is what he says. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Powerful passage of scripture here in 1 Corinthians 15, that descriptive passage of what the resurrection is all about and the particulars. So we move then between these three links to, as we get to the final thoughts of tonight's message. The first thing I want to remind you of this is that we are told according to the scriptures prior to the resurrection story, that God is the author of human essence. God is the author in the essential nature of our humanity. We didn't come into being by accident. We just didn't suddenly appear unconceived or without any purpose in mind, but that God himself is the designer and brought us into existence. The psalmist says, when I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the sun and the moon and the stars which you have made, what is there in man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? This fact of our creation is a vital source in enabling us to understand what it means to be human. It's a vital source, giving us the generality of our essence created in the image of God. <coughs> Some of you have probably heard me mention this simple conversation between Jesus and the one who was questioning him, trying to pit him against uh, the Caesar. And he looked at Jesus and he said, is it all right to pay taxes to Caesar? The one question I wish so desperately Jesus had answered differently. Then on April 15th, you could be godly and rebellious at the same time. <laughs> Jesus, so brilliant in his response, he says, give me a coin. And he took the coin and he says, whose image do you see on this? The man says, Caesar. Jesus says, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and give to God that which is God's. The disingenuousness of the questioner is noticed in the fact that he did not come back with a second question. He should have said, what belongs to, see, what belongs to God? And Jesus would have said, whose image is on you? Give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. Give to God that which belongs to God. God's image is on you. But no, the naturalists who tell us they will debunk the notion of the resurrection because it is a miraculous intervention in the normal processes of, of life and death will also tell you they do not need God to explain the origin of the universe or God to explain the creation of us divine entities. And yet if you read the scientists again and again, you'll see how they end up with systemic, ideological, and philosophical contradiction. And scientists themselves, disgusted with the approach of sheer, rugged, natural, and natural naturalism, unvarnished, are beginning to realize how undefendable this really is. David Berlinski, who doesn't have a dog in this fight here, 
He is not a believer. In fact, he is an avowed skeptic. But when Richard Dawkins wrote his book, The God Delusion, David Berlinsky responded with his devil's delusion. And on the inside flap of the cover, he says this, has anyone provided a proof for God's in existence? Not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it is here? Not even close. Have the sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything so long as it is not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? Not even close to being close. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy of thought and opinion within the sciences? Close enough. Does anything in the sciences or in their philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Not even in the ballpark. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt, dead on. This is Berlinsky. Now, I have a reason for taking you through this route, and then the first point, you're going to really have to put your thinking caps on here. What is the reason they deny the resurrection? Because it is an extra natural, it is a supernatural intervention in the normal affairs of people. What is the reason they deny the creation uh, story? Same, same facts that they supposedly bring to bear. Now notice where they end up in their own convoluted philosophizing. You see, there are really four fundamental laws in nature that they wrestle with. Law of gravity, the electromagnetic field, and the strong and the weak nuclear forces. The law of gravity, the electromagnetic field, the strong and the weak nuclear forces. They have to bring these together in some uh, permutation and combination to explain how the universe even came into being. Now notice how the astronomers and how the physicists have wrestled with the conundrums. Here, for example, is Sir Frederick Hoyle, along with Chandra Vikramasinghe, uh, who is a Sri Lankan uh, scientist. Listen to what they say. In calculating the odds that all the functional proteins necessary for life might form in one place by random events, they come up with this figure of one chance in 10 to 40 thousand of how these proteins can all come together. These are skeptics, Hoyle and Vikramasinghe. That's one followed by 40,000 zeros after it. One in one followed by 40,000 zeros. But then he goes on to say this, however, since there are only 10 to the power of 80 atoms in the entire known universe, and the chance of this happening is one in, the, in, the, uh, in 10 to 40,000, they've concluded in these words, it is an outrageously small probability <laughs> that could not be faced even if the whole universe consisted of organic soup. Now notice the next comment Hoyle makes. Life could not have originated here on Earth, nor does it look as though biological evolution can be explained from within an Earth-bound theory of life. Genes from outside this Earth are needed to drive the evolutionary process. This much can be consolidated by strictly scientific means, by experiment, by observation and calculation. What he's saying is there is no way on Earth for this to have produced what we have. So what does he conclude? He goes with the panspermia theory. Do you know what that is? Spores were brought from another planet to seed the earth in order to, that's Sir Frederick Hoyle. All right, Stephen Hawking, listen to what he says. Why did the universe start out with so nearly the critical rate of expansion that separates models that recollapse from those that go on expanding forever? so that even now, 10 billion years later, it is still expanding at nearly the precise critical rate. If the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in one quintillion, by one part in quintillion, I'm translating it from the British uh, million, which is different to the US here, so he comes out here, by one part in a thousand million million, which is one US quintillion, I think, 
the universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached the present state. So then he goes on to say this, even if there is only one possible unified theory, it would still be a set of rules and equations. What is it that breeds fire into these equations and makes a universe for them to describe? The usual approach of science of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the questions of why there should be a universe for the model to describe, and why does the universe go to, go to all the bother of existing at all? What place do we then have for a creator? Okay, Francis Crick, listen. An honest man, armed with all the knowledge of avail available to us, can only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment, listen, to be almost a miracle. <laughs> so many other conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. Prominent physicist James Treffel, and this I'll close that thought, in his book Are We Alone in the Universe, says this, if I were a religious man, I would say that everything we have learned about life in the past 20 years shows that we are unique and therefore special in God's sight. If I were a religious man, that's what I would say. Instead, I shall say that what we have learned shows us that it matters a great deal what actually happens to us. So here you've got it. Hoyle, Hawking, Francis Crick, who got the Nobel Prize for cracking the code of the DNA, and James Treffel, coming out with one of two extremes, one saying, mathematically impossible to explain. The other saying panspermia, and by the way, Francis Crick believes the same thing, that uh, spores were brought from another planet to sow the seeds right here in our Earth. And as for James Treffel, he said, if I were a religious man, I'd have no problem explaining this, but I'll just say it matters an awful lot what is going to happen to us. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? That's what I believe is the first link that we get in the generality of creation and in the particularity of human life. I move quickly. First, we've got the story of how we have the created order that God is the author of human essence. Second, we have God the redeemer in human existence. God is the redeemer in human existence. But what we watch here now is the story of brokenness and the story of fallenness, and the story of the despicable nature of sin. You know, I marvel at how many stories we read in our newspaper again and again and again. The evil that we read about, the tragedies that we read about. I did a little write-up on Newtown after the tragedy took place, as many people did. I'm sure many of you did, blogged on it, commented on it. What do you do? You're silenced. In fact, got a call asking you I would come there and do some meetings. I said, give it some time. These kinds of wounds are very painful. Having been at Columbine sometime after it happened, also at Virginia Tech after it happened, I've always wanted time to provide a real means of God's healing process. But I think of all the discussions that have taken place, the one big question that is always unaddressed in this. You see, it took three things to do that killing. It took a young man, it took a gun, and it took some ammunition. If you like to talk about the young man, probably with all of his psychological problems, and in lawmakers, we like to deal with a weapon. How can we bring this all to an end by just removing that kind of weaponry, and I'm not minimizing either. All of these have to be discussed. They are vital in a civilized society. We deal with it. But we make an extraordinary mistake when we think that the only thing that provided the ammunition was the bullet that he used. Have you ever thought of the ammunition that goes into the minds of our young people today in front of the television set? Have you thought of the ammunition that sophisticated academics pour into young lives by destroying their belief in the value of human life and its essence? Have you ever thought of all the ammunition that goes on with the perversion 
that pours into your thinking and mind day after day after day. No, we'd rather deal with the obvious, the physical sight of a weapon. We don't deal with the reality of what it means to be depraved within the human heart and how we can find an answer to that. You see, here's the thing I want to say to you. The same week that we witnessed Newtown in that horrific atrocity, another atrocity was played out in the city in which I'd made my home for many, many years, where I was raised in the city of New Delhi, India, where six thugs got onto a bus. They had no gun. They had no bullets. They just took some iron rods and staffs and poles and battered a young woman, a young woman to a point that she was so brutalized and plundered in her body that no hospital in India found within itself the resources to mend her body. They flew her to Singapore, and within a few days, she lost her life. And the man she was with, I forget whether he passed away or what, he too was bludgeoned. Five ordinary village-type people with no gun, with no bullets, ravaged a young woman like that, a beautiful young woman preparing to study psychotherapy, sent to an early grave. The depravity of the human mind. You know, my wife wanted so much to be here, and uh, we've been through a tough 10 days. I'd gone to Australia and come back and finish some meetings, and she had gone to represent me for some board meetings in Singapore and India. First time we were back together after three weeks, it was a week ago Sunday, and Margie and I were packing some boxes, preparing to move, and she got up on a small step ladder, and I was in a room, other room, putting some of my books in or whatever, when I suddenly heard this crash and a scream. And she came crashing back, and when I walked in, it's a sight I'll never forget. She was just staring glassy-eyed into the ceiling, and her arm was just completely limp. And I just burst into tears and bent down, couldn't move her body. She said, please don't, don't touch this arm, something's happened. And I called the paramedics and all of them and took them about 30 minutes, first giving some morphine to kill the pain, and then 30, 40 minutes to get her onto a stretcher. It was a complete clean fracture of the humerus, upper right humerus. Do you know what happens when your bone's broken? I had a broken back at one time. You can will all you want to will, and you cannot move that extremity. You can want to make all the decisions you desire, and she couldn't move that arm and still is in trouble with it, probably for some weeks, if not some months to come. Is that not an indication of what happens when the soul has ruptured and broken and fallen away from God? You can will all you want to will. You cannot rescue yourself. You cannot redeem yourself. So the story of creation is linked directly into the story of redemption, and both of them take a miraculous intervention. Both of them. So those who deny the miracle of the resurrection are forced to deny the miracle of the new birth. Remember a long time ago, not a long time, but a couple of years ago, maybe even less than that, a book was written that ought never to have been written, which was called Love Wins. And one of the statements, I, I don't like to criticize people's writing, but I remember when I came to this line in there, I put it down and I said, my word. When he made the comment that nowhere in the New Testament does it talk about receiving Jesus Christ into your life as your savior. You know what, folks? I came to know Jesus Christ when I was 17 years old on a bed of suicide. All the willing I'd done for 17 years had just ended up me in a complete and ended me up in a complete mess. And I'm an apologist. We argue from here and find the bridge to here from the head to the heart. We do it all the time. But I'll tell you what, no matter what arguments are presented to me at the end of the day, I know in whom I believed. I know who's redeemed me. I know the divine encounter and what happened to me in that hospital room. 
I know the transformation that took place, the new hungers, the new loves, the new desires, the new passions. All of these came by divine intervention. It was a miraculous intervention of God himself into my life just as he's intervened in yours. And until we understand that it really takes a supreme intervention of God himself to overcome the dastardliness of evil, the inclinations of the heart, until we understand that, we can just sort of stop short with one idea of the miraculous, either in the creation or in the resurrection. We will lose sight of one of the greatest down payments of the ultimate resurrection, which happens right now as God brings new birth within you and brings that dead soul to life, as it were, bringing the new life into you. This society does not understand evil. That's why it does not understand the miraculous power needed for the new birth. Adolf Eichmann, when he went to trial, I remember being in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem when I was doing a research for one of my books and the people took me in and showed me reams and reams of material and in fact, there were young people going through the entire manuscript and the, and the transcripts of the Eichmann trial and a lot of it fascinating to read how he was uh, brought in by the Mossad from Argentina in a cloak and dagger operation that's told in the book, The House on Garibaldi Street and ultimately put into a film. How the intelligence so brilliantly operated at Peter Malkin was at the helm of it all and brought, them, brought uh, Eichmann back in a brilliant maneuver and took him back to Israel for his trial. And Hannah Arendt, of all people, writes the book on the trial and execution of Eichmann. And her book ends with this paragraph. Adolf Eichmann went to the gallows with great dignity. He asked for a bottle of red wine and drank half of it. He refused the help of the Protestant minister, the Reverend William Hull, who offered to read the Bible with him. He had only two more hours to live and therefore no time to waste. He walked the 50 yards from his cell to the execution chamber calm and erect with his hands bound behind him. When the guards tied his ankles and knees, he asked them to loosen the bonds so that he could stand straight. I don't need that, he said. And when the black hood was offered him, he was in complete command of himself. Nay, he was more. He was completely himself. Nothing could have demonstrated this more convincingly than the grotesque silliness of his last words. He began by stating emphatically that he was no Christian and did not believe in life after death. He then proceeded, after a short while, gentlemen, we shall all meet again, such is the fate of all of us men. Long live Germany, long live Argentina, long live Austria. I shall not forget them. In the face of death, he had found the cliche used in funeral oratory. Under the gallows, his memory played him the last trick. He was elated and he forgot really that this was his own funeral. It was as though those last minutes he was summing up the lesson that this long course in human wickedness had taught us, the lesson of the fearsome word and thought defying banality of evil. You trivialize evil, you trivialize the new birth. You trivialize, trivialize the new birth, you will ultimately tri trivialize the created order. And these two links in the mind of the Apostle Paul were absolutely critical as he led to the resurrection. That God is the one who is really the creator of our human essence. He is also the redeemer of us in our human existence. And then he leads us to that final of all truths here. He tells us how God is really the hope from death's dominance. God is our ultimate hope from death's dominance. Defines our essence, redeems us in our existence, and gives us the hope against death's dominance. I want you to follow me very closely now because I'm bringing this all down to the tip of the funnel here, the lower end of it. What? is the resurrection all about? How do we know that it really happened? See, once upon a time, the swoon theory, the hallucination theory, the fraud theory, and the stolen body theory, all of that took their turns and made their rounds. Swoon theory? That changed the disciples from a bunch of frightened Boy Scouts, as it were? 
to be willing to be martyrs where 11 out of the 12 died a martyr's death? Hallucination, where psychiatrists will tell you hallucination is sort of a single individual's experience, not with 500 of them hallucinating at the same time. As Karl Barth said, all you listen, all you need to do is listen to them arguing against each other and they decimate each other's argument. And Barth was right in that. I want to give you what classic arguments are given, 10 of them, for the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I will close by adding two more links to that. So here they are. Number one, the disciples eyewitness experience where they saw and felt and touched. They saw, felt, and touched. I come from India. My father was from Kerala. My mother was from Chennai. I was raised in Delhi. Kerala is in the deep south, Delhi is in the north. Kerala has a little town called Kodangalur. It is the place where the Apostle Thomas first set foot on Indian soil. There is a huge amount of extra biblical material available on this. I researched it, I picked it up from people like the Venerable Bede to other well-known patristic fathers and so on who testify to Thomas going there. The oldest church in India is called the Martoma Church, named after him, after Thomas. And I ask you, why would a man have done what he did and paid with his spear-thrusted side because he said he would not believe until he saw and felt and touched? And the eyewitness of Thomas is, as he knelt and felt that side, or kurios mu, or theos mu, my Lord and my God, the transformation of Thomas. Why did 11 out of the 12 disciples die a martyr's death? And by the way, Thomas Aquinas makes a vitally important point here about these martyrdoms. He said they all died alone. They died alone. This is not 12 or 50 or 60 of them in one room all of a sudden deciding to come up with a, with a theory and a story and being gutted by flames. Peter crucified upside down. Paul stoned on the Appian Way. And here Thomas on Indian soil being speared to death. There's a memorial to his death to this very day. They died alone. They weren't looking for some great uh, celebration on the outside and some cheering. They were, they were murdered and slaughtered in so many different ways. And they paid for this. Think of all things of the vision of Peter who even after seeing the transfiguration, a sight given to just three of them. So profound was the transfiguration experience where he said, let's stay right here. I don't want to leave, leave here. Even after that, he went on and denied his Lord. Then he says, but now we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to heed that as a light in a dark place. What Peter is, what's happened to Peter is a remarkable transformation. And I su suggest to you that he saw Moses, he saw Elijah. It took the resurrected Christ to transform this man. So number one, you see the disciples as eyewitnesses. Number two, the early proclamation of the resurrection. So powerful. These documents are so powerful. You know, a few years ago, I was in Tirana in Albania. I just finished speaking at the parliament and then spent about an hour with President Berisha. Fascinating conversation, which I won't betray to you. But after that, uh, the curator of the museum said, I really want you to come to the museum, please. I said, I'm very tired this afternoon. I've got to do an open forum at your university. He said, please come. I'll give you something of a treat you'll never forget in your life. I promise you. And I was a guest, and I told my videographer, Bob, I said, why don't you go with me? I'm, you know, I'm tired, but let's go. We went, and they were surrounded by all kinds of militia. I wondered where we'd come. 
And I walked into the room, all guards around the room and uh, people packing an auditorium. And he takes me in and he introduces me in their language and then he turns to me in English and says, will you please repeat the message you gave to the members of parliament this morning? So I looked at him and said, I thought you were gonna give me a surprise and a treat I'd never forget. He said, it'll come, just speak. I did it in about 20 minutes and then we sat down. All of a sudden come three or four guards with their arms outstretched like that, all of them wearing blue gloves. And one man, one man following them with blue gloves in their hand places one in front of Bob Tigert, my videographer and myself. And they place these volumes in front of me. The four gospels written in gold ink by the hand of St. Chrysostom. In the 400s. In the 400s, Ceausescu tried to burn them. Somebody hid them. And what you ended up as a result, preserved, perfect, perfectly justified. Why did men like that preserve these documents willing to risk their entire life for you and for me? The, gospel, the early proclamation of the resurrection with the documents, three, their transformation from fear to martyrdom is remarkable. Number four, the empty tomb. Number five, they proclaimed it in Jerusalem itself where it all happened. Number six, no contrary evidence when those would have desperately wanted to prove it wrong all they would need it to have done is produce the body. Instead, Rome itself bent its knee to the message, the power of all that was happening. Seven, the existence of the church founded by law-abiding monotheistic Jews. Eight, the change of the day of worship to Sunday. Nine, the conversion of James. Ten, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Number one, eyewitness experiences. Number two, early proclamation of the resurrection. Number three, transformation of the disciples from fear to martyrdom. Four, the empty tomb. Five, they proclaimed it in Jerusalem itself, right where it happened. Six, no contrary evidence when, they, that, when those who wanted to prove it wrong would desperately have wanted to produce it. Seven, the existence of the church founded by law-abiding monotheistic Jews. Eight, the change of the day of worship to Sunday. Nine, the conversion of James. Ten, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. I've already spoken to you about Peter and Thomas. Can I add just one more? Why on earth would they have first put the evidence in the mouths of women? <laughs> tell me, tell me, in a society where their word would not have counted in court. So if anybody is scheming this thing up, anybody is trying to create a scenario that would be the last place they would have gone to find authority. It's just like my Lord, just like my Lord, who take those that the world was marginalizing, just like my Lord on the cross, to look at the young man and point to his mother and say, take care of her. She's your mother now. And then he comes into the garden and appears to the women and says, you go and tell the disciples and you go and tell Peter, these boys weren't ready for this kind of a primary source. <laughs> it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Something else. Why would he have said he was going to bodily rise again when he could have hoodwinked them like other Eastern mystics and said, I'll spiritually rise again. How do you ever falsify something like that? 
How do you falsify it? Say, he's spiritually risen. He said he would bodily rise again. You know, I'm not kidding you when I tell you this. Take these 10 to 12 to 13 evidences and put it together and try and then defend the swoon theory, the fraud theory, fraud theory the stolen theory. And uh, I think Spong came up with what dogs ate the body and the book came out, Spong was wrong. Anything Spong believes, I don't know where he comes up with. I think he lies in bed at night wondering what weird idea can I come up with tomorrow morning. All these other theories. And I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says, and to me, the least of all, he says, one abnormally born. You know what he's talking about? One dragged out of the womb, unwilling to come out. And he goes and writes for us one third of the New Testament and changes history as it was known then. And he says this, different to all the other disciples, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. That I may know him, the powers of his res resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Follow me. Every other disciple came the other way through the cross to the resurrection. He came the reverse way from the resurrection to the cross that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Let me take you back. Creation, the general value of you as an essential person the particularity of you as an individual. You see, many humans die every day. We can't mourn for all, but God gives us those special relationships when we lose someone close to us. That particularity of that person becomes important for us to know whether the resurrection idea really is true and the fact of the resurrection is historically tenable because then we'll see this loved one again, the hope. And then we go through the redemption who brought the miracle of new birth into you and to me. From the miracle of creation to the miracle of the redemption to the miracle of the resurrection. Follow me carefully here. What goes on with the skeptic here? Please follow me. I don't know why I think up these things, but I do. You know, my wife and I celebrated 40 years of marriage last year. If salvation were by works, she will get to heaven just for having lived with me for 40 years. But thank God, <laughs> we'll get there by grace. Here's what I want to say to you. When it comes to natural law, the skeptic invokes the natural law as an absolute and will not allow for the miracle because it's an exception. He wants the absoluteness of that which is routine, repetitive and will deny anything that is an exception because it invades his preconceived notions. So he holds on to the absolute in the created order and denies the miracle because it's an exception. When it comes to moral reasoning, he reverses that. He takes the exception in order to argue against what's normative. That alone ought to tell you what these boys are all about. They want an end game in sight. They want to get to the end without God. And so when it's convenient, they'll hold on to an exception. When it's inconvenient, they will deny an exception. So in the created order, they hold on to the absolute, deny the exception. On moral reasoning, they hold on to the exception to deny the absolute. That's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. I was with a professor of law of a very prestigious university. I'll close with that, end up with a couple of illustrations here, and I'll be through. If I named him or the position he held, all of you will know what I'm whom I'm talking about. But I was having coffee with him for one hour, total skeptic, before I lectured. This is not long ago. He said, you know, Ravi, when I was young, I had all the aspirations, and I was very conservative in my thinking, my values, my beliefs. Then I got into university and got everything the way I wanted it to go. And I became extremely liberal and jettisoned all my absolutes. And I became the chief legal counselor. And he named the person for whom he was the legal counsel. 
He said, you and I are sitting across this table now. You're in your 60s. I'm approaching 70. He said, I'm back to my conservative way of thinking and wondered where all the years went that I squandered in debunking absolutes and debunking all those notions. He said, you know, friend, I want to tell you something. If there is an answer, I'm coming more and more to the conviction it'll have to be in Jesus Christ. I know of no other. He writes to me. He writes to my colleague in Oxford, John Lennox. Why? Why? I'm now a grandfather. We have one little grandson. I spoke to him on the phone today. He's 19 months old. Hi, Papa. Hi, Papa. Hi, Papa. It costs a nickel and a half to just keep listening to that, but it's fun. <laughs> And I watch him walking around and I think to myself, why am I enjoying this so much? I had three. What's the difference? I think there's a difference. You know what the difference is? You have a stock of emotional energy available at any given day. When you have your own, you're spending all of that in care, responsibility, worry, provision, all that kind of stuff. You've got very little left to really enjoy it. Now, when it comes second time around, somebody else is spending all the emotional energy on running around doing this and this. You've got all of this energy to enjoy it. When he was born, I happened to literally arrive as she was being taken to the hospital got to the hospital and saw the first sight of the baby coming and being placed on the mother's breast, my little daughter Naomi, and the husband Drew standing there. I'll never forget it. You look at the life and you say, wow, how precious, how particular. And the nurse comes and sits down and goes through everything and she says, now Naomi, you got a bracelet on your wrist. Jude's got a bracelet on his wrist. If anybody takes that baby away from this floor, as soon as they get onto the elevator to go to another floor, you'll hear an alarm ring in your room. We'll hear one ring in our office. And my daughter's face fell. The glory of a new life was suddenly dimmed by the tragedy of depraved human behavior. And one day, we'll all come to that moment of being called home. And the Apostle Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all not sleep, but we shall all be changed the moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. I close with these two little illustrations that I hope will be meaningful for you. A few years ago, my father-in-law, Lindsay Reynolds, passed away. He was one of the most amazing men that I knew. He was really like a dad to me. He was a chemical engineer by training, brilliant man. Loved the hymns. From the moment he found he had cancer till he died, it was four months. Shock. And I went and spent time with him. My, my, my wife, Margie, we spent a lot of time with him. I loved my father-in-law very much. He always called me ravioli. <laughs> <clears throat> He never had a son. <laughs> and I went and sat down and held his hand and we chatted of all the great things and he said, I'm so sorry, son, this has come so suddenly and so on. I had to go away for some meetings and the day he was going, he'd been silent for a few days. He was 85, been married 63 years, I believe. He'd been silent, shriveled down to a bag of bones. Didn't say a word. Then his eyes open, three of his four daughters around the bed, his wife around the bed there. They all said this. He opened his eyes, looked to the heavens, and he said the word, amazing. That's amazing. Then he looked at his wife and said, Jean, I love you. And he was gone.
Gene, I love you. And he was gone. What a way to say goodbye to this world. The glory and amazement of what you see and bidding goodbye for having honored the love of your life. All of this only makes sense if you are created by God, if you're redeemed by him and ultimately resurrected for a future hope. And so the songwriter says, but just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's, of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory, finding it home. As a traveling man, no word means more to me as an abstract sounding word, but with all the concrete reality as the word home. You see, C.S. Lewis is right. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. That is the hope that God gives to you and to me. And so the three links, the miracle of creation, the miracle of redemption, and the miracle of the resurrection. You know who knew it best? Lazarus. You can go to Larnaca today and see his grave. He became a bishop there. Do you know what it says on his grave? Lazarus, Bishop of Larnaca, twice dead, friend of Jesus. I'm glad he's not just your friend and mine, he's also our savior. And as a friend of mine used to say, if we don't see you in the future, we'll see you in the pasture. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please be seated. Thank you. Well, it's really wonderful to be here, although I must confess, after a great two-and-a-half-week break, it was hard to start packing again, and I couldn't find most of the things that I normally keep in my case ready to go, but before Christmas, I'm under orders from my wife that every suitcase has to go into the basement. So it went to the basement, and now then I had to go looking for it. But um, she was going to be here as well. Two days ago, I came back from work about 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and she was completely horizontal, worn out, sound asleep on the couch. You see, we had the grandkids for four days. <clears throat> that is the most exhausting expression of love you can ever have. You know, they say some people bring happiness wherever they go, and others bring happiness whenever they go. And <laughs> Grandkids accomplish both of those things. When you see them coming in, you're ecstatic. And after they leave, you sit down and look at each other. And for about 30 minutes, you say absolutely nothing. <laughs> They're worn out. So I just saw that poor thing so worn out. And I said to her, you don't need a trip right now. Just uh, get some rest and don't tell anybody you're staying home. Just get so. She apologized. And as I was leaving, I said, you know, it's strange. I told you. You didn't have to go, but you never told me that. <laughs> I do have to go. She said, you better explain that to Robert Morris or I'd be in trouble. So here, we are delighted to be with you. And if you'll allow me a couple of personal words, please, it does two things. It allows my vocal cords to get worked up a bit, otherwise I run into trouble. Some of my colleagues are here, two of my Dallas-based colleagues. Dan Wrangle is here, Dan right in the second row, and Krish Dunham next to him. Both of them are fine apologists globally. They do a marvelous job. One of our beloved board members is here, Victor Abraham and his wife. So nice to have you all. And Chris is with his wife too. Dan is not married yet, so pray for him. We'll be looking for a partner for him. And then 
One of my Cleveland-based colleagues is also here. Where are you, Sanj, in the second row? And Vince Vitale is here. I'll say a word about him later. And Thomas, who covers the globe with me. We were on the road for over 200 days last year. I could never, ever have done it without his help. He's an amazing young man and never leaves even one thing uncared for. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, as we just uh, <laughs> celebrated, you know, he and I had a long talk before Christmas. I said, you know, you don't have to keep doing this. It's extremely exhausting. You'd never know how many hours of sleep we lose on the road, sometimes two or three nights in a row in these long halls where you think you should have celebrated a few birthdays along the way. And yet Thomas has been right up to the mark, and I deeply appreciate his commitment. Two of my favorite preachers are here, of course, James Robison, whom we love so much. Delighted to work with him. And Robert, your whole team, what he said is true. The launching of that institute, if you remember when I was here last year, I was talking about it, and we had a steep climb, a really steep climb, three days before the deadline. The last of the gifts came in. We are in the process of moving into that building. It's a five-story, 125,000 square foot building. We'll be training the, world, the world's apologists there. Please pray for us. Vince Vitale is going to be the executive director of the Institute, highly educated with his master's work at Princeton, his doctoral work at Oxford. He was a tutor at Oxford on our staff, gave up that prestigious position for him and his wife to come and direct the Institute. His wife, Joe Vitale, also got her doctorate from Oxford just a few days before they left. They're now Atlanta-based. And this book that Robert talked about, Jesus Among Secular Gods, he really is about 60, 70% of that book. He does all of the groundwork. We deal with humanism, relativism, pluralism, scientism, all of the isms that should have been wasms, but are still very much <laughs> with us. I wish I could claim that humorous line from myself, but it isn't. Evie Hill was the one who used to say, I'm tired of these isms that should have been wasms. You know, but all of these isms that we face today, we collaborated on the book just released. In fact, I only saw the first copy today myself. Get a hold of it. If you have students at university or high school, give it to them. It deals with all of these challenges and presents the uniqueness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's already rated as the number one on Amazon for Christian apologetics with numerous reviews that have come in. I take those few moments to tell you we labor long and hard to deal with these subjects. And I can assure you it's really not for personal gain. It's to wrestle with the issues of our time. May God bless you and you have a wonderful new year. May 2017 bring you great joys and great opportunities to serve the Lord. So in the light of that, my message tonight is entitled, The Passing and the Abiding. The Passing and the Abiding. What will always come to pass and what will abide forever? I'll never forget some years ago, quite a few years ago now, when my first daughter, my oldest child, Sarah, we live in Atlanta, and she was heading to Covenant College in Lookout Mountain. And my wife and I took Sarah to drop her off there, and I was heading straight from there to Hartsfield, the airport in Atlanta, to fly out. We helped her unpack and put all of her boxes together. Margie was staying on an extra day, but because I was flying out for some meetings, I left. I was totally unprepared for the emotions. Completely unprepared. And as I pulled away from the front of her place where she was going to stay in the dorm, I still vividly remember her standing behind the screen door. And as I got onto Interstate 75, I couldn't last more than about five to seven minutes. I had to pull over onto the side and let my heart just express the emotions. And one of the songs that came to my mind was that one, is this the little girl I carried? Is that the little boy at play? I don't remember growing older. When did they? How did she get to be a beauty? How did they get to be so tall? All those beautiful lines. And how seedlings turn overnight to sunflowers blossoming even as we gaze. It was a moment to remember, a hinge moment in your life that changes come 
and they are emotionally laden. Yes, it is a change we had to expect. And no, it was not a grievous change, but it was an emotional one to remind us that time inexorably moves on. Only the eternal word abides forever. God has given us a calendar. And I often am asked by somebody sitting in an audience to be very philosophical, and they say, what is time? And I give them a very simple answer. It is this. It is a calibration of change. You measure change, whether it's the clock or whether it's the calendar. Time goes on, and we measure change, and time is that necessary component in that. But as I ponder the whole reality of change, I keep thinking of how the swirling emotions take over through those process of changes. America is in a process of change. Many are not willing to accept it because they want things the way they've always wanted things. But time moves on, change comes, and God reminds us that the glory of the Christian life is in knowing how to handle change. And I want to talk about three of those changes, but one of those attitudes towards change can be very fatalistic, or a pie in the sky by and by when I die. It was James Whitcomb Riley in his poem, A Life Lesson, who says this, "'There, little girl, don't cry. "'They have broken your doll, I know, "'and your tea set blue and your playhouse too "'are things of the long ago. But childish troubles will soon pass by. Their little girl, don't cry. Their little girl, don't cry. They have broken your slate, I know. And the glad wild ways of your schoolgirl days are the things of long ago. But life and love will soon come by. Their little girl, don't cry. Their little girl, don't cry. They have broken your heart, I know. And the rainbow gleams of your youthful dreams are things of the long ago but heaven holds all for which you sigh. There, little girl, don't cry. Whether it's the doll or the slate or the broken heart, we seem to keep pushing it forward. Maybe heaven, heaven, heaven will have it all, and the brokenness will always follow us in this world. But God gives us a perspective of how to leverage and how to harness the now. I would like to bring to you three of the greatest changes that God brings into our lives, one or two of them in which we had absolutely no choice, and a couple of them in which we will have a choice. I remember years ago, coming back from a cruise in Alaska, and you go through the Seymour Narrows, and the captain of that cruise ship had gotten to know me as we were taking that cruise, and so he brought me over to the bridge, and at that point, he takes over. No second in command is piloting that huge uh, vessel at that time, and he told me why. He said, the tallest mountains from below the waters are right here. It is a mariner's nightmare, and he was showing it to me on the radar screen. They are almost at a standstill pace, moving and navigating very carefully every person at their station as the captain moves it along. And I thought of the hymn in my younger days as we used to sing, Jesus, Savior, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous seas, unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass come from thee, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Some of you may have lost some loved ones last year, and Christmas was not the happiest of moments for you. We will be, if the Lord spares us, celebrating Christmas next, this coming year. But none of us knows who will be with us and who will not be with us. That's the chart and compass that, to which we look. In fact, straight from here, tomorrow morning I'm flying to Houston. My colleague Nabil Qureshi, many of you may have read his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, in his early 30s, strapping, handsome, powerful conversion story. Such a persuasive speaker, just a few months ago, was shocked to, literally to his very bones when he found out 
he had stage four cancer of the stomach and the doctor didn't give him very good chances of surviving that. He's at the MD Anderson Clinic in Houston and I fly from here tomorrow morning to go and spend the afternoon with him. We never know what news lies ahead. And this is not to paint a grim picture, it's just to remind us that time inexorably moves on. We have things that come and go, and the chart and compass must come from our Savior, who will pilot us through the most treacherous areas of life, and that's the promise he holds for us. And so what are the three changes that come to us that bring to us this reminder? The first, you may think is obvious, it's so obvious that we miss it. It's coming from non-existence to existence. There once was a time where you were not, and then there was a time where you came into being. Only of the Son of God, it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The Son was not born, the Son eternally existed, he was given, the child was born. But you and I had a time where we were not and then were called into being. It is David who says this remarkably, for you created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. You and I are in the thoughts of God. How vast to me are these thoughts, how precious, how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. David said that, and his son Solomon said, God's ways are as mysterious as the pathway of the wind and as the manner in which a human spirit is infused into the little body of a baby while it is yet in its mother's womb. David goes on to say, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above thy heavens? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings have you ordained strength. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You see, your name is of value because of the name of the one who formed you. His signature is on your soul. His signature is on your soul and mine. This forming that God gives to us for a purpose, just think about it for a moment. You know, an amoeba has a single little eye that is much more a mechanism than it is uh, even top properly called an eye. One cell. There are 107 million cells in the human eye. From that fertilized ovum, over nine months, it comes to about a trillion cells. One single strand of the human DNA. If you were to put it into, into print, and you put 500 words per page and 600 pages per volume, it would take a thousand volumes put it, to put your DNA in there. 600,000 pages. He made you so beautifully unique that he made you for a purpose. He brought you from non-being into being. You are not the random collocation of atoms or accidentally on this blip of time. You were designed specifically for a purpose by the living God who brought you into being for a purpose. And if there's something that I think you ought to do for yourself this year, pause and ask God, what is it he's made you for? Wasn't it Mark Twain who said two of the greatest days in your life? Number one, the day you were born, and number two, the day you find out why? 
Why were you born? When he's put his signature on your soul. When I was a young lad, a family of five kids, my dad at that time pretty hard on me, pretty tough on me, and he had reason to. I wasn't going anywhere. In fact, my mother used to talk in a Tamil phrase. I won't give you that language. Literally, if anybody speaks Tamil, it says, Dandasotha Rama Gundupota Vada. It literally means this wandering Rama goes all over the world, but at the sound of food being put on the table, he'd show up, you know. <laughs> that was me. Dandasotha Rama Gundupota Vada. You know, you put the food on the table and he shows up. And my dad one day looked at me and he wasn't being funny. He looked at me and he said, you're going to bring the greatest shame to this family ever. You're heading nowhere. And in a shame-oriented culture, I knew that was my death knell. And then I'll never forget the first honorary doctor that was given to me sometime, I don't know when it was, late 70s or early 80s, at Houghton College in New York. My mother had passed away by then. She died in her 50s. My dad came for that and he was sitting on my left. And he'd gone and bought my hood, which they were going to drape on me. And I still remember him sitting there with his head thrown back, saying, is this for real? Is this really happening? And it was not at all surprising, literally a day before he died, but he didn't know he was dying then. He opted for open heart. And I lived in Niagara Falls, New York. He lived in Toronto. All of my brothers and sisters still live in Toronto. The closest was my older brother, 10 minutes away from him. He phoned me in Niagara. He said, son, I want you to take me to the hospital. I'm not feeling well. I said, dad, Ajit is near. He said, I want you to come. So I got into my car, drove the 75 miles, headed to Toronto, picked him up. I didn't realize why. All the way to the hospital, he talked to me about the premonition that he didn't think he was going to come out of this. But there's one score he needed to settle before he passed away. He said, I need to ask your forgiveness for all that I thought of you and mentioned to you. See, we have to, as earthly parents make a lot of mistakes. We all do it. Our heavenly father doesn't make those mistakes. His signature is on your soul. He's called you, fashioned you, brought you from non-being into being. About a, two years ago, the man who led me to the Lord who brought the Bible into my room, some of you here know him, Fred David, I spoke to him, he was in Los Angeles, and he was literally a few days away from breathing his last, and he phones me, and with a broken voice on the phone, he tells me, Rav, he said, sometimes I think I came into this world just to bring that Bible to you. I said, Fred, you did a lot more than that. But you see, the purpose that God will use you for, you have no idea how he can use you as salt and light in this world. Whether you realize it or not, you're an influencer. You influence people. And he brought you from non-being into being. There Lewis Thomas and his Medusa and the snail talking about the marvel of life. He makes this in, 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 in incredible statement. The mere existence of this cell should be one of the greatest astonishments on the face of the earth. People ought to be walking around all day, all through their waking hours, calling to each other in endless wonderment, talking of nothing except that cell. If anyone does succeed in explaining it within my lifetime, I will charter a skywriting airplane, maybe a whole fleet of them, and send them aloft to write one great exclamation point after another around the whole sky until all of my money runs out. This exclamation mark, this thing we call life, spoken into existence by God. You were brought into being from not being on being. There was a day where you were not, and all of a sudden you were. Find out the purpose for which he created you. That change from non-existence to existence is wrapped up in your individual entity. You are not a quantity. You are an entity. God has a specific purpose for you to fulfill. When you find that out, your last breath will be one of delight in saying, I'm waiting for the divine accolade. Well done. Well done. That's the first change. But in the midst of that change, there may be numerous disappointments, the brokenness, the struggles. 
When I broke my back in 1985, I didn't realize what changes it was going to bring upon me. I was athletic, I was a sportsman, I loved the sports field, I loved tennis, I loved cricket. All of that had to bid, be bid goodbye in the day when I, when I herniated two or three discs of mine and now have those titanium rods at the back. The writer has put it well, our life contains a thousand springs and dies if one be gone. Strange that a harp of a thousand strings can stay in tune so long. Our life contains a thousand springs and dies if one be gone. Strange that a harp of a thousand strings can stay in tune so long. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's a wonderness, wonderfulness to it. There's a fearsomeness to it. That's the first change that I wanted to address. The second is the change of transformation. First is your formation. Then is your transformation that God takes you from mere existence to meaningful existence. He brings you into a new set of hungers, a new set of delights, a new set of wants, and new paradigms by which you measure your life. This is so unique in the Christian life. It almost can take place in a moment, but you know it is spread across time. You ask anybody else of any other worldview, I don't care what worldview it is, what religious worldview it is, it is only this Judeo-Christian worldview that talks about the new birth and the new life. They make fun of it in terms of being born again, but it is not only the greatest mystery, it is the greatest astonishment when you realize you are not exactly who you used to be. The new desires, the new changes, the new longings, the new habits that he puts into your heart. You know, uh, the one that captured this so well, I think one of the greatest books ever written was written by a tinker by the name of John Bunyan. And it is called A Pilgrim's Progress. Translated into more languages than any other book outside of the scriptures. And you, if you've not read Pilgrim's Progress, you've picked your own pockets. <laughs> Get a hold of it. Well, I remember going through his home in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom. My wife was with me and there was a lady at the desk and there were people from Japan and Korea and all over the world visiting. And I said to the lady, isn't it amazing? This little book. Think of the millions of tests. Do you know what she said to me? I'm not making this up. I have a witness and my wife standing next to me. She said, I haven't read it. She was the receptionist. I said, you haven't read it. She said, well, I, I'm not into allegories. I said, get the children's version, please. <laughs> Even the children's version is so remarkable, so beautiful. If you haven't read it to your kids, start reading it to them. It tells the whole gospel. And the climactic moment comes <clears throat> when Pilgrim has got this burden on the back and he's coming out to meet the, coming up to the hill and he meets three angels. The first is the angel of dawn. And when the angel of dawn meets pilgrim coming, he just says to them, you know, that uh, thy sins be forgiven thee. And the whole back comes rolling down uh, the hill. And it says how the tears were just pouring down his face. I re really believe Bunyan had read the story with the woman of alabaster ointment to find the terminology for this. Because the tears flowing just like the woman, peace be unto you, just like the Lord said to her, and he was just not willing to leave that moment, the angel of dawn, and then you get the angel of daybreak, the angel of daybreak takes away the old garments, and puts on the new ones, and puts the mark on the forehead, and then there's the angel of dusk, which gives a scroll to give you a map for the journey, what more do you want? I sins be forgiven thee, the new garments that you now wear and the map to lead you on and guide you into the future. The angel of dawn, the angel of daybreak and the angel of dusk. He calls them the three shining ones. How beautiful an ordinary tinker seeing the beauty of the gospel and he takes you through all of Vanity Fair and all of that stuff and brings you right to that mountain where at the sight of the cross, the bag just falls down. 
You know, recently when Cliff Barrows passed away, I told the story of a memory with Cliff and his wife, and they lived in Atlanta for some time after his first wife, Billy, had passed away. He married beautiful Ann Barrows, and they made their home in Atlanta, Georgia. We used to meet quite often. Cliff is an amazing, was an amazing man, absolutely an amazing man. He got the world singing, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. But Cliff didn't know that my worldview changes at 9 p.m. So he came to our house for dinner, and about 9.05, the lights started to go out in the house. He was still telling me all of the memories of his years with Billy Graham, what flight they'd missed, what they had in Northeast India, and so on. And as these lights are going off, Anne says to him, darling, I think We've outstayed our welcome. The lights are going out in this house. So I said, it's okay, Cliff. Your stories are more interesting. I'll turn the lights back on. And then before he left, said, I said, Cliff, I want to tell you one story that you probably don't know. He said, what is it? I said, there was a man who came to meet me when I was speaking for James Kennedy once. He walked up to the front, and he shook hands with me. And I said to him, what's your name? He said, uh, I'm, uh, I said, where are you from? He said, Romania. I said, what's your name? He said, Dwight Barrows. I said, Dwight Barrows from Romania? I said, how does a Romanian get a name like Dwight Barrows? <laughs> he said, it's a long story. He said, you know, during the days of Ceausescu, I wanted to escape. I swam across, swam across some waters. I arrived in Vienna, and I stood outside the American embassy day after day, begging them to let me in. I wanted to meet the ambassador. They wouldn't let me do it. So I kept sitting outside the embassy and said, I'm not going to leave, not going to leave till you allow me to meet the ambassador. So he comes into the embassy. Finally, the ambassador says, bring him in. He said, what do you want? He said, I want to move to America. He said, I don't want to go back to Romania. And the ambassador looked at him and he said, you know what? I like you. I'll give you the visa to get to America, but you're going to have to promise me to read two books. He said, which books are those? He gave him the Bible, and he gave him the biography of Dwight L. Moody. He said, read these two books. I'll get you into America. And they came here. He said, so I arrived in Detroit. I started working for the automotive company, but I got into alcohol and drugs. I was basically making a mess of my life. Periodically, when I was sober, I would read Barrows's, I would read uh, Claire, Dwight Moody's story and so on and so forth. And he said, one night I was so down, I started to walk way towards the Pontiac Stadium. I said, thousands of people coming out, and I thought it was a football game. I found out it wasn't. It was some kind of religious meeting that was going on. And they were leaving, and it was over. So I walked up to the platform to find out what it really was about, and there was a man there folding chairs. And the man looked at me and said, can I help you? He said, am I late for the meeting? He said, yes, it's over, but come on up, let's talk. And he said, that man led me to lead Jesus Christ. His name was Cliff Barrows. Cliff looked at me and his eyes got so flooded with tears. He said, Ravi, I remember the incident. You got to be kidding me. I said, Cliff, after he came to know the Lord, he got baptized and he took a uh, Dwight L. Moody's first name and your last name, and he was baptized as Dwight Barrows. <laughs> About five or six years ago, Cliff phoned me. He said, do you know how I can get a hold of him? I said, well, you know, why don't you just Google his name? It's not a common name. You know, you'll, you'll find it out. And, uh, he did. He tracked him down. He tracked him down. And Cliff, in his book of memoirs, was going to put the whole story down. You see, when transformation comes, there's always a series of events and a series of people involved. You never do it on your own. God brings somebody into your life. Just before I came here, Pastor son James came and asked me if I'd sign a copy of that book for a friend who's in the audience tonight, who said he was an atheist, read the book, I don't know whether it was Can Man Live Without God or which one, or one of the programs we'd done, and gave his life to the Lord. He's in the audience here tonight. If you went from story to story to story, you'll find out the power of the transformed life, the power of transformed hungers, how it is that God really brings changes, and changes not only what you do, 
but changes so marvelously what you want to do. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know Christ, as you enter 2017, make this the moment of the year where you invite the Savior to transform your life and give you the new hungers and the new desires. You may be a slave to certain habits. You may be in bondage to certain affections. You may be trapped and you say, Ravi, you don't know my story. I am so bound in chains. And that's what the writer once said, didn't he? The intense is the agony when the eye begins to see, the ear begins to hear, the heart begins to pound, when the soul feels its flesh and when the flesh feels its chains. When the flesh feels its chains and you find there's one who breaks those chains and gives you the new desires and the new birth within your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel message at its core, that the cross of Jesus Christ is provided for your redemption, for your salvation, for your restoration. And it is the glorious message of the Christian gospel alone, nowhere else. You ask a Buddhist, how do you attain nirvana? Stop desiring, stop desiring. Pull yourself up by your own metaphysical bootstraps. You ask the Islam Muslim, how do you attain paradise? His answer will be very simple, that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. You ask anybody from the pantheistic worldview, the way you break karma is by allowing your goodness to outweigh your badness. And what it is that Christ does for you and me, he takes his goodness to overcome our unworthiness and gives it to us. And so you have it bringing you from non-being into being, bringing you from the whole story of uh, your, your transformation, of giving you new hungers, giving you new desires, and giving you a marvelous, marvelous new life. You, I, I don't know if you know the story that uh, uh, Dr. Sangster tells us. Dr. Sangster tells us that this preacher who had come from Leeds, towards the north, way down toward the southwest in Plymouth in those days gone by. And he was preaching in that one small town there. And he decided to make a trunk call, as they call it, back home. And the telephone call would weave through its way, through its operators, and ultimately get to its destination point. And while he was waiting, he began to mutter the words of a hymn where he said, my knowledge of this life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all and I shall be with him. My knowledge of this life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all and I shall be with him. One of the operators listening and said, sir, sir, will you repeat those words for me, please? repeated it. My knowledge of this life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but it is enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. And he heard her starting to weep and then sob and say, you'll never know, you'll never know what those words mean to me right now when I'm needing them the most. And so a preacher making a telephone call from Plymouth to Leeds mutters the words of a hymn not knowing that somebody else is listening in and the transformation that comes in the life from those four simple lines. The gospel story is beautiful. My formation, my transformation, and lastly, we come to my translation. What is that translation? That translation is simply this. The day comes where we bid this earthly world goodbye and we are welcomed into the heavenlies where we are getting that glorified, that new body, that incorruptible body. We must all be there at some moment. I look back upon this year and think of the friends at whose funerals I have spoken. Friends who loved us who did so much for us, who've gone on to be with the Lord. And I know many in their younger years, my colleague Michael Ramsden's father-in-law, from diagnosis to death was a few days in the month of December, 
very suddenly diagnosed with a certain form of cancer and within a few days was gone. And so Christmas begins to look back at one empty chair, but we realize that the translation comes and it's a moment that we do not know of, but it will come. My good friend Paul Valentine, who preached in Stowe, Ohio, was speaking at his uh, at a funeral we, I was that I was attending, and he tells the story of his father, who had passed away some time before. He said, "I remember being in the ambulance and driving to the hospital, and his father leaned over and said, Paul, I recognize where we are. We're right by the bank, aren't we?'" And he said, "Yes, Dad." He said, you know, I have something in there. I have some accounts in there. But Paul, I want to tell you something. All of a sudden, it doesn't mean very much. Take it, use it, yourself and the grandkids. But it doesn't mean very much anymore. I've never forgotten that. You can be on your way to your own death and go past all the institutions that you trust in. And you say, doesn't mean very much anymore. So what abides forever? It is that relationship that God has promised you, the relationship that he wants to give you. And that's why Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, grave, is your sting? C.S. Lewis says this, most of man's psychological makeup is probably due to his body. When his body dies, all that will fall off him, and the real central man, the thing that chose, that made the best or the worst out of this material, will stand naked. All sorts of nice things which we thought were our own, but which were really due to a good digestion, will fall off for some of us. All sorts of nasty things which were due to complexes or bad health will fall off others. We shall then for the first time see everyone as he really was and there will be surprises. <laughs> and there will be surprises as we see each other as we really are. I want to tell you a couple of stories as I close and stick to my just go up a minute or two over my time. <laughs> Nick Charles was the first sports broadcaster the CNN ever hired. I remember seeing him come to the Lord some years later. He was a playboy by his own admission. Beautiful mop of hair, handsome guy. All the women fancifully imagined them having a nice evening with Nick Charles. Handsome fellow and he knew it and used it. All of a sudden, you know, he said he needed to settle down and got married and officiated at his wedding, married, married to a beautiful girl, Corey. They had a lovely baby. Long story. A few years ago, he contacted me. He said, Ravi, I'm in trouble. I need to see you. I thought, what's happened? So I arrived at a restaurant, and I looked and looked for him, and he put his hand up. He said, Ravi. I said, Nick? The hair was all gone. The face was sunken. He'd been diagnosed with cancer and he was dying. Not that far advanced in years. I said, Nick, when did all this happen? He said, man, it's been a miserable journey. I've got a little girl now. And that's all I can think about. He moved over to New Mexico and Santa Fe. And a few days before he died, he said, can I see you? I said, Nick, I'm about to make a trip but I'll come. So Margie and I went to see him and Corey. He was completely worn down to bone and skin. And he said, sit down here on my bed, please. So I sat down with him. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, Ravi, the world will mock what I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to tell it to you. He said, a few days ago, I was lying with my little girl beside me and my wife, Corey, and I was in such pain. I said, God, I've had enough enough. I don't want to say goodbye to my family, but it's time for me to go take me home. He said, Ravi, I want to tell you something. I promise you this happened. A light shone in the corner of my room 
and a figure that I could imagine only to be Christ, walked over towards me, sat exactly where you're sitting, took me by the hand and said, Nick, I'm going to call you home, but not tonight. Just hang in there. I said, Ravi, it happened. Put my hand on his forehead and prayed for him. And I said, Nick, all I can say to you is this. God will always meet you in the way you need him to meet you, especially when you are totally helpless. And I'll take your story at face value. A few days later, I was in Singapore when Nick passed away. And the CNN producer phoned me and he said, can I talk to you? He said, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, Nick Charles. You knew him? I said, yeah. He said, man, I love the guy. He said, we're doing a story on him on CNN. He said, but this story about Jesus coming into his room. He said, what do you make of it? I said, what do you think? I said, what do you know of Nick? He said, he was for real. I said, why don't you take his story as that which God knew Nick needed and gave it to him when he was at his most helpless state. He said, man, I can't get that story out of my mind. What I say to you is this. God will give us enough hints along the way. As he did my father-in-law. Minutes before he died. He looked up to the ceiling. He hadn't spoken for days. And he looked up to the ceiling and said, amazing. That's just Amazing. And then he looked at his wife of 60 some years and said, Jean, I love you. And he was gone. Handel's Messiah was playing in the background. I believe it is Wordsworth who wrote this. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell? She answered, seven are we. Two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother. And in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. How many are you then, said I, if two are already in heaven? The little maiden did reply, O oh, master, we are seven. Death doesn't change the reality. I was 10 years old when my grandmother died, and I'll close with this. All I remember about that, actually nine, I was nine. All I remember about the funeral was a hymn they sang, Abide With Me. Fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. One of those verses says, swift to its close, ebbs out life's little day, earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away, change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. The passing and the abiding, our formation, our transformation, our consummation, three of the greatest changes that God brings into your life May you know him so that you will eternally dwell in his presence for his word abides forever and the scriptures cannot be broken. He has promised to prepare a place for you and me. If it were not so, he would have told us, enter this year knowing that swift to its close ebbs out life's little day, earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away, change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changes not, abide with me. May God richly bless you. Thank you for having me here in your presence.